I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the current state of um, technology for charging stations. The passenger cars have available to them uh, actually three levels of charging. So level one would just be, you can plug it into your household outlet, but that's very slow. So mostly people use either level two or level three. Level two is like a electric stove or an electric dryer in a house. So it's uh, 220 volt and it's quite a bit faster. So you could have your electric car parked at home and in several hours, maybe depending on the car, six, eight, 10 hours, it can completely recharge from being fully discharged. However, even that would not be practical for long distance travel where you want to be able to stop somewhere, recharge, trying to resemble stopping at a gas station on a long road trip and then being on your way. So uh, for that reason, we have this level three charging, which is 480 volts. It's like twice the household voltage. So more powerful than any residents would have in their house. And it's also direct current. So because the battery is direct current, there's no conversion between alternating current and direct current. So just as a side, like most of the time in our houses, what comes out of the wall is alternating current and you might have a device that then converts it back into direct current, like in your, uh, your laptop or something like that. So for long distance trips, you have this network of these 480 volt direct current level three fast chargers. And there, depending on the need, like in 20, 30 or 40 minutes, the person can put enough charge in their battery that they can get going again. So now it's starting to resemble going on a road trip with a gasoline powered car. So if we were to convert the current uh, network of gasoline and diesel filling stations to a network of electricity and hydrogen charging stations, you could imagine like that's, that's a massive number of charging points. Think of all the gas stations there are in the country. Not only that, but also we don't have enough electricity supply today. If we look across, the majority maker is, is fossil fuel and natural gas being the number one generator of electricity in the United States right now. But then also we have renewables that are growing and we have nuclear. But even so, if you look at that number right now, we would be maybe one or two trillion kilowatt hours a year short on that supply. So we would have to build that up. If we think about hydrogen specifically as a uh, energy source for transportation different from electricity, there's a number of technical considerations, costs, risks that are gonna be different, but also some benefits. So let's talk, let's talk about the benefits first especially for, let's say, uh, long distance trucking, which is such a big user of, uh, of energy. Two big potential advantages are the hydrogen uh, as an energy source compared to electric batteries. You can refill the hydrogen fuel tanks in a hydrogen powered truck much faster than electricity. So that usage would kind of resemble what the trucking industry does now with refilling diesel tanks in, in trucks. Secondly, the, the amount of weight that it is taken up uh, by the hydrogen tanks and the hydrogen is much, much smaller for long distance trucking than uh, equivalent um, battery systems. When you have to store so much energy in the batteries, it just takes up a lot of weight. And that's, really, that's a really important commercial consideration in trucking. Uh, because you want to be able to carry as much economically valuable weight on the truck. And when you're eating up that weight with a whole bunch of batteries, like it affects the economic viability of, uh, of trucking. So some of the technical concerns are, well, maybe not a concern so much, but just the function of the, the fuel cell. You can actually use hydrogen in an internal combustion engine with pistons and cylinders, but it turns out that a hydrogen fuel cell is for that application much more efficient. What the hydrogen fuel cell does is it takes the hydrogen and it just makes a lot more of the energy available than does an internal combustion engine. And then what comes out of the fuel cell is actual electricity. So at that point, the hydrogen fuel cell truck becomes like an electric vehicle. Electricity from the fuel cell goes to the motors of the truck and, and that's, what, that's what propels the truck. Turning to the rail sector, the kind of infrastructure transitions I see are a, a mixture of more electrification, meaning more like wires and electric locomotives, and also changing the energy supply on the existing diesel locomotives 
potentially to hydrogen. One of the reasons we might go there is to provide wires to our entire U.S. network of freight railroads. And it's, as we know, it's a vast country. And you're talking about very, very long distances. And it just might be more cost effective to use hydrogen in place of trying to, to provide uh, wires absolutely everywhere. If we talk about the energy transition in water shipping, we can like look at the global market for shipping and recognize that the, the biggest user is long distance over the ocean, container ships, bulk commodities, and then a lesser amount is like in canals and inland water transportation. There again, it's very, very early days how you would convert that over to a carbon-free energy source. But it seems like the most likely one is again hydrogen because you can carry so much of it um, on the ship. So when we talk about the cost of the transition and who's going to bear the cost, is it the the private individual, private sector, is it the government? The government has to be the one that provides the incentives to allow this transition to happen without a, a terrible economic shock. But knowing that eventually, if it's government debt, eventually it has to be it has to be paid back. But um, uh, but it's either that though, or the other thing would be like you know even more climate cost, and then you have to pay for that too. So, um, and I, I by the way, I'm not like an optimistic person by nature, and you're hearing this from me. It is like you know, there's tough outcome A and there's tough outcome B, and that's all I'm seeing.